Hello, everyone. We are here for the virtual book salon of Ronak K. Kapadia's Insurgent Aesthetics, published by Duke University Press in 2019 in the Art History Publication Initiative series. So my name is Karim Kupchandani. I'm a Mellon Bridge Assistant Professor of Theater, Dance, and Performance Studies and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Tufts University. And I'm really delighted to be here to moderate today's discussion as we celebrate the one year anniversary of this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous book. I just wanna quickly note uh, that today's event is being live captioned. So you can select the closed captioning at the bottom of the Zoom window. Um, and we'll also drop a link in the chat for captioning as well. And I, I just wanna say thank you to Deborah Thomas for doing this. Um, I want to start us at the end with the epilogue of Insurgent Aesthetics where we meet Congolese American activist, Therese Patricia Okumu, scaling the Statue of Liberty in 2018. As cultural critics, we tend to valorize critique from below because governance is, is enforced from above. But Ronak's epilogue titled Scaling Empire asks what might be achieved when we pay attention to scale, bringing close what has been made far and also makes clear other physical and aesthetic locations from which to look anew, to quote, peer down at the ground queerly and with fresh perspective, unquote. Insurgent aesthetics, security, and the queer afterlife of the forever war is indeed a fresh perspective. It is a study of visual arts working to restore body, sensation, and perspective to the violent and distancing practices of governance which deform data in order to justify warfare. Uh, or justify warfare, occupation, incarceration. And more specifically, Ronak explores visual artworks, including film and installation by South Asian, West Asian, Middle Eastern, and Muslim artists in the US and Europe responding to the forever war. And he gives us this framework of the forever war to disrupt the, the historical frame of a post 9-11 global war on terror and, and include the Cold War and other US incursions into South and West Asia and then also capture the condition of ever-present material discursive and sensorial violence of warfare in the Asias and the diaspora. Insurgent aesthetics argument about the violence of visuality and the capacity for artists to rethink aesthetics of warfare tracks through the entire book and each chapter and all the art objects feel fresh and different from the previous. And I was lucky to teach this book this spring in my performance studies graduate seminar and and the way I frame the seminars, I sort of give a tour through major conversations in the field and then conclude with four new books. And one of my students, after reading Ronak's book toward the end of the sem seminar asked, what if we started here with this book? How could performance studies track if we started with Kapadia? And, and I love that because this book could indeed be a new starting point for interdisciplinary arts-based scholarship one that centers politics, but also honors aesthetics. Um, so I really love the book. I loved teaching it, I loved reading it. Um, and I'm really excited to hear everyone speak today. But before we begin our panel, just a little bit of gratitude. First, we wanna thank uh, Duke University Press for hosting today's salon as part of their In Conversation virtual series. And in particular, to exhibit's manager, Jessica Malatoris, for helping to organize today's book salon. Today's virtual event is also sponsored by the program in Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago and will be featured as part of the American Studies Association's 2020 Freedom Courses in a series of recorded public facing conversations tied to the 2020 annual meeting organized by ASA President Dylan Rodriguez. The event is being recorded and will be posted online at the ASA Freedom Course and Duke University Press's In Conversation YouTube channels. Um, and the, the links should be in, in the chat um, and, and hopefully you can find them there soon. And finally, uh, we hope that after today's discussion, you will consider purchasing copies of Insurgent Aesthetics on dukeupress.edu, Duke which is currently having its very famous fall 50% sale right now. Um, I always spend a lot of money there, <laughs> but um, use the code uh, that we're dropping in the chat for 50% off of Ronak's book until November 23rd, 2020. Um, I'm really excited to hear from Ronak today and also from our wonderful and esteemed res respondents. And I'll briefly off offer bios. 
Um, and, and their longer bios are available on the event invitation page, which you'll find in the chat. And, you know, we're all here together and we're all here online. Um, and so I want to encourage you to use the chat to talk to us, to talk to Ronak, um, to offer your thoughts and, and ideas um, and responses. And just make sure that you drop down in the, in the chat and choose um, all panelists and attendees so everybody can see, see your comments. And we have a little bit of time for a Q&A uh, right at the end. So if you have questions, um, because we're, we're just using the chat, I'm gonna suggest that you put a couple, a couple of asterisks right before your questions so we spot them and don't miss them in the Q&A. Um, but onto our really incredible panel and they will, they'll speak in this order for about uh, eight to 10 minutes each and then we have time uh, for a Q&A after. Um, so first we have our wonderful author, Ronak K. Kapadia, who is Associate Professor and Director of Graduate Studies in Gender and Women's Studies and Affiliated Faculty in Art History, Museum and Exhibition Studies and Global Asian Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He's the author of the book we're celebrating today, Insurgent Aesthetics, Security in the Queer Afterlife of the Forever War. Professor Kapadia is at work on a new book entitled Breathing in the Brown Queer Commons, Migrant Futurisms of Collective Survival, Healing and Justice in the Wilds of US Imperial Decline. Following Ronak, we have Jody Kim, who is Associate Professor of Media and Cultural Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Professor Kim is the author of Ends of Empire, Asian American Critique in the Cold War from University of Minnesota Press in 2010 and co-editor of Critical Ethnic Studies, a reader from Duke University, University Press in 2016. Following Jody is Sarah Mameni, an assistant professor of ethnic studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Mameni is completing their first book titled Crude, the Art of Living in the Terracene, which considers the emergence of the Anthropocene as a new geological era in relation to the concurrent dec declaration of the war on terror in the early 2000s. And then we have Keith P. Feldman, Associate Professor of Comparative Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Feldman is the author of A Shadow Over Palestine, The Imperial Life of Race in America from the University of Minnesota Press 2015, and is also co-editor of Hashtag Identity, Hashtagging Race, Gender, Sexuality, and Nation from University of Michigan Press in 2019. So um, let's, in the chat, give our round of applause and hashtags and uh, celebrations to Rona Kapadia. Thank you, Kareem. How beautiful, what a gorgeous opening. It's so good to be in communion with you. Hello, everybody in the chat. It's so great to see all the folks who've Zoomed in today. I'm so grateful for your virtual presence. I already feel like crying. Um, I'm gonna try to keep it together. Uh, this has been such a wild, eviscerating, weird year in so many different ways. And I know we are all looking for moments of refreshment and relief. And I've been looking forward to this event for many weeks for that very reason, um, to be in conversation with my dearest colleagues, Kareem, Keith, Sara, and Jody. Thank you so much for making time on this day um, to be with me. Um, I also want us to reflect back on this year and all its twists and turns as insurgent aesthetics has taken flight. Uh, before I offer some framing remarks for our conversations today, I wanna also just reiterate my thanks to everybody at Duke University Press, especially my esteemed editor, Ken Whisaker, as well as Jess Malatoris for helping to organize today's event. Um, ASA President Dylan Rodriguez for publicizing this event among the freedom courses of this year's ASA. Jenny Breyer and the entire GWS program at UIC for helping me make this event more accessible through live captioning. Thank you also to all the countless many who have supported this long haul project over the years, from friends, family, colleagues, anonymous reviewers, editors, mentors, coaches, students, artists, curators, organizers, and comrades who have all pushed my thinking forward in every direction. I'm indebted to you. So I've been talking and researching and writing for many years about the need for sensuous alternatives and a politics of refreshment in the wake of unending wartime violence. Insurgent aesthetics is about the interface between contemporary Arab, Muslim, and South Asian diasporic visual art and aesthetics and US global warfare and militarism in the greater Middle East. This book explores the sensorial and tactile registers in the contemporary works of minoritarian and diasporic artists as antidotes to the atomizing tactics 
of US counterinsurgency warfare and as a queer feminist methodology of rebellion and freedom. The research for my book was motivated by a supreme dissatisfaction with the dominant discourses of 21st century national security and empire, including the ongoing global war on terror against the shape-shifting constellation of enemies and the attended cottage industry of terrorism studies that has so impoverished our political imaginations to date. Indeed, there's so much overlapping dread and despair today that it often feels like these affective conditions have evaporated any semblance of joy, renewal, resistance, beauty, or alternatives. I sought to write a book that could intervene into this dystopian here and now by spotlighting the radical experiments, sensuous knowledges, and freedom dreams of contemporary minoritarian cultural workers responding to and complicating our collective reckoning with the state of forever war. And I wanted to think of aesthetics here not only as a theory of beauty or value, but of relation, a vast relational orbit of sensuous affiliations, a queer poetics of relationality, or non-blood-based forms of kinship, fellow feeling, and care. Turning to the more expansive world-making knowledge practices of contemporary Arab, Muslim, and South Asian diasporic artists, what I call insurgent aesthetics, inaugurates new ways of understanding the politics of security and freedom from the perspective of those most dispossessed by U.S. war-making and their diasporic kin. Armed further with a critical appreciation of the queer utopian function of art, insurgent aesthetics reveals how diasporic expressive cultures have made available new ways of knowing, sensing, and feeling that were once thought to be unintelligible or unimaginable. So as Kareem also kind of noted at the beginning with that really beautiful um, rendering of my epilogue, I wanted to write a book about U.S. empire in the greater Middle East that could address both the multiple scales and transformations of late modern wars, while equally imagining outside, beyond, and below its stranglehold and forms of imperial dominion when global wars finally miss their mark. So much of the popular and scholarly criticism of U.S. militarism attuned so closely to the dominant strategies and technologies of national security that such work often has the unintended effect of making the state's frameworks and institutions seem monolithic and omniscient, even as that work seeks to critique war and empire. My book attempts to plot another more arresting approach by tracing how this global world order is in fact already fleeting, fragile, and always failing. As I described throughout, felicitous cracks have appeared in the surface of the US forever wars architecture that are being exploited by forms of fugitivity, refusal, and rebellion, and that can be gleaned further in the critical works of art under investigation in my book. So the book specifically traces how Arab, Muslim, and South Asian diasporic multimedia artists in the US and in Europe have grappled in their works with the US national security state's use of gendered racial violence, including targeted killing via drones, imperial confinement through military detention, and overt settler colonial infrastructures via the client state of Israel and the occupation of Palestine. While this book focuses on the historical present, it understands violent settler colonial histories of settlement, land theft, native genocide, African chattel slavery, and Asian exploitation as wholly vital to not only what Lisa Lowe vividly names the intimacies of four continents, but also the genealogy of the contemporary forever war. As insurgent aesthetics depicts, these braided histories of violence and their material afterlives are imprinted onto the DNA of the forever war and in the very practices of state violence that the artists in my book interrogate so evocatively in their creative works. And so by using this language of insurgency, insurgent aesthetics, I try to summon the long history of subterranean and fugitive consciousness of insurgent struggle, what Ruthie, Mil Ruthie Wilson Gilmore calls infrastructures of feeling against the forces of empire, gender racism, and capital. This fugitive consciousness of insurgent struggle is key to making visible so as to undermine the forever war. In the process, the book makes three principal arguments that I'll just enumerate before turning things back over um, to our panelists. 
First, by linking its investigation to a long history of US war, empire, and counterinsurgency, the book seeks to argue that new forms of remote killing, torture, confinement, surveillance, and lawfare have created a distinctive post 9-11 infrastructure of racialized state violence, both within and beyond US borders, with longstanding consequences across US political administrations. Second, the book makes the case that the contemporary art that I study is a site of social critique that disrupts conventional myths and ideas about the United States and its national security apparatus. My formal analyses of visual art and performance art examine how Arab, Muslim, and South Asian diasporic multimedia artists living in the heart of empire have made palpable the unseen and forgotten dimensions of secrecy and terror that define the U.S. security state. And third, and finally, the book argues that the forever war is an assault on the human sensorium for citizens, subjects, survivors, and refugees of US empire alike. Its study of contemporary artworks illustrates the centrality of the body and the human sensorium to both war making and to subjugated knowledge about the global war on terror. By foregrounding what I'm calling a queer feminist decolonial critique of neoliberal security and war, the book depicts what is absented and ghosted by US technologies of extraction and state knowledge. These artists force a reckoning with the intimate, redacted, and ghostly matter of forever wars, what I call the sensorial life of empire. In short, Insurgent Aesthetics investigates how contemporary artists challenge violent histories of US militarism and create alternative ways of knowing, feeling, and sensing beyond permanent wars. Ultimately, the book tries to argue that critical analysis of insurgent art and culture can excavate subjugated forms of knowledge about the United States and its forever wars, a vital resource for policy, activism, and social transformation. So with that, I'm happy to pass things off. I'm very eager and kind of nervous um, to hear from our panelists, my dear, dear friends and colleagues. Um, and so I'm gonna pass things off to Keith next. No, that's Jody. Jody Kim. Yes, yes, here I am. Thank you to everyone who made uh, today's important conversation possible. I will dive right in in the interest of time. Analyzing an impressive range of cultural forms produced by South Asian, Muslim, and Arab diasporic artists, Insurgent Aesthetics provides an urgently necessary alternative mapping of US intervention in the greater Middle East from the late Cold War to the present and ongoing so-called global war on terror. The significant and broad implications of the scholarship cannot be overstated. Insurgent aesthetics offer something that is always encouraged of scholarly work, but not always necessarily delivered. That crucial combination of originality, significance, and timeliness articulated with trenchant thinking and beautiful prose. In particular, there are four significant aspects of this project that are worth highlighting. First is the book's crucial conceptualization of what Rona calls insurgent aesthetics as an analytic framework that at once critically magnifies and refreshingly generates alternative forms of knowledge about the gendered, racial, homophobic, and imperialist violence of US militarist intervention and wars of counterinsurgency in the greater Middle East. We might name this violence as a kind of counterinsurgent aesthetics, and we can apprehend its formal features, both as the forms of violence itself, that is, um, whether drone warfare, torture, or immigrant detention, and the discursive regime through which that violence gets represented or absented. Relying on the dialectics of transparency and opacity, counterinsurgent aesthetics privileges the formal abstractions of the aerial, the vertical, and the visual. Counterinsurgent aesthetics also relies on the authority of cold data as a dominant form the so-called expert knowledge of US government discourse, the social sciences, and more recently, militarized anthropology through programs such as the human terrain system. 
Roanoke's new nuanced analysis demonstrates how the insurgent aesthetics of the cultural forms he examines at once makes visible counterinsurgent violence and the warping effects of counterinsurgent aesthetics. Crucially, the conceptualization of insurgent aesthetics also constitutes alternative knowledge projects, imaginaries, and inhabitations beyond the unrelenting violence of the forever war. Through a focus on the imaginative, psychic, and corporeal registers, Insurgent Aesthetics, the book, offers a robust analysis of realms that are often ignored or understudied. Affect, fantasy, embodiment, and the senses, including but importantly extending beyond sight and the visual. What emerges is a densely layered theorization of how gender, racial, and imperial violence is experienced, perceived, and felt. This interrogates violences, abstractions, and rationalities, the statistical modes through which the collateral damage of war is calculated, and exposes instead another calculus of bodies in pain and ways of imagining life beyond pain. Ultimately, what this study demonstrates is in part the very failure of hegemonic calculation. This brings me to the second significant of a queer calculus in determining how the putative expert knowledge of US government discourse and the social sciences simply do not add up. Bringing what Rona calls a queer feminist fugitive critique to bear on questions of warfare, terrorism, militarism, and global security makes an unparalleled contribution to the multi-sided and multi-generic literatures on these questions and topics. This is an unparalleled contribution, not only because it takes seriously what are by now familiar intersectional analyses of race, gender, sexuality, and so forth, but also because it productively expands the conventional objects of fields such as queer studies to include violent practices such as drone warfare within the context of permanent warfare. What are the effects of these practices on those who are targeted and what alternative forms of being and knowing in the world do such differentially vulnerable and insurgent bodies in turn enact and imagine. Third, insurgent aesthetics productively interrogates the periodization of US imperial intervention in the greater Middle East. Rather than taking 9-11 as the starting point, the book incisively extends the periodization specifically back to the late Cold War period and broadly contextualizes it within the evolution of the U.S. settler states' unrelenting wars since its very founding. By thus tracking the specificity of the long war and now the infinite war, the Pentagon's own terms for its multiple wars of counterinsurgency throughout the globe from the Cold War to the present so-called global war on terror, insurgent aesthetics demonstrates how the post-9-11 racialization of Islam and political demonology condensing on the figure of the so-called terrorist have genealogies that extend far back. This is not to collapse historical specificities and differences. Rather, it is to interrogate the endurance, the long durée, if you will, of US counterinsurgent violence. It is also to track both continuities and novelties. Fourth and finally, the conceptualization of forever war in insurgent aesthetics counterintuitively highlights how the very brutality and unrelenting contours of US settler colonial and imperial violence are actually the marks of imperial failure and decline. Forever war, in other words, is in one respect the sign of US settler colonial and imperial dominance, Yet the very fact that such dominance needs to be continually reasserted, demonstrated, and violently imposed is a symptom of its fragility, vulnerability, and ongoing failures. Forever war, in other words, 
perpetually defers a widespread apprehension of those failures. Yet as the ongoing, yet as the epilogue, yet as the epilogue of insurgent aesthetics eloquently reveals, imperial decline leaves room for wildness, a quote, critical praxis of the wild to flourish. I'll end on that note. And we'll now turn it over to Sara. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to join you all here for this panel discussion. Um, I want to begin my uh, thoughts and my remarks on insurgent aesthetics by sharing an anecdote about my own copy of the book. Uh, so earlier this summer, I packed my library to move to Berkeley from Los Angeles. Uh, when packing a library, there's always this question of how to organize books so that you can find them easily should you need to. Um, before you've had a chance to unpack all of them. So alphabetizing is always a good way uh, to pack your books, but so is thematic organization. And um, this summer when I was packing, I went with this thematic organization. So I had books um, in boxes labeled queer theory, art and art history, uh, black studies, swana his history, aesthetic theory, and so on. So a month ago when um, Ronak graciously asked to bring us together for this panel discussion, I had a moment of confusion about which box um, held his book and had to open a few boxes before I finally found it in queer theory. I share this um, anecdote, this story, to first point out the expansively interdisciplinary nature of insurgent aesthetics and to um, uh, point out the range of varied perspectives and theories that uh, the author Kapadia brings to reading individual artworks, as well as the political present of what he calls the forever war. It is compelling, for instance, to read data collection for military intelligence gathering analyzed through affect theory, or to find geographies of empire building described through the erotics of the flesh. These are indeed reading strategies that had me categorize the book under queer theory in my library. But I also share the story of losing uh, Ronak's book in the gaps of the interdisciplines in order to point out another aspect of the book's materiality, which is its ability to disappear under surveillance. This is a book that does not fit easily within stable disciplinary categories and allows itself to become unintelligible under scrutiny. Such acts of political opacity is indeed a methodology that Kapadia himself recognizes and highlights in the works of the artist he discusses in the book. These are acts of insurgent camouflage that allows queer feminist artists of color to combat the disciplinary and criminalizing gaze of institutions and nation states. Refusal is always political. The refusal to be seen and to be known has long been theorized by critical race theorists and notably indigenous scholars as a decolonial aesthetic practice. As Audra Simpson evocatively wrote in Mohawk Interruptus, quote, I want to push turning away into a, an ambit of refusal, of simply refusing the gaze of disengagement and to the possibilities that this structure is subject formation, but also politics and resurgent histories, end quote. This refusal um, to be thought of as a turning away from the scrutinizing gaze involves ongoing search for languages, discourses, and creative spaces that are not delimited by state-sanctioned projects of rights and recognition. This is precisely what Gina Starblanket calls resurgence. Conventional definitions of the concept of resurgence, she writes, quote, describes it as a form of awakening or revival after a period of dormancy. In indigenous context, she continues, it also carries a particular cultural and political meaning, referring to a course of action geared towards the revitalization of our traditional ways that were disrupted through colonialism. Kapadia's insurgent aesthetics bears a close resemblance to indigenous theorizings of resurgent practices. While the insurgent is a racialized figure named the terrorist, 
who is vulnerable to militarized counterinsurgency of efforts of multiple transnational and allied security sta states. The insurgent is also, as Kapadia points out, quote, a figure of hope, possibility, futurity, and trespass, end quote. It is indeed this inspirited futurity that Kapadia demonstrates through the artwork cited throughout the book. And here I want to conclude by reminding us of one such moment in the book. The book's final chapter is devoted to the multidisciplinary work of the Palestinian artist Larissa Sansour. In the final pages of the book, Kapadia reads Sansour's 2009 video titled A Space Exodus where the artist appearing as an astronaut plants the Palestinian flag on a planet in outer space. Shortly after this triumphant feat, however, as Kapadia describes it, the astronaut loses her radio connection to the earth while desperately calling out Jerusalem, Jerusalem into the intercom. While this loss of connection to the earth and specifically to Palestine has been read as Sansour's dystopian aesthetics, Kapadia offers another perspective. In his analysis, this loss is indicative of the artist's ambivalence towards statehood, sovereignty, and, and possession, especially land possession. In the scene of um, the Palestinian astronaut, she is untethered, disconnected from the space station, from the earth, and from her homeland. This untethering sits in stark contrast to the colonialist desire for settlement on foreign lands, which the astronaut initially exhibits when she triumphantly plants her flag. In Kapadia's reading, it is the astronaut's final disconnection, her untethered weightless swaying in the atmosphere that becomes the source of her future's politics. Rather than reading futurity through the heaviness of settler colonial arrival, of unloading, building, planting, settling in, Kapadia reads the astronaut's weightlessness, her levity, her ethereality, her flight as a decolonial, decolonial futurist sensation. In Kapadia's words, quote, Sansur leaves us with a complex structure of feeling that is about not only statelessness, but weightlessness also. To be without gravity, untethered by the weight of the body and its inscription is a queer feminist decolonial sensation, end quote. Kapadia's politics of flight and levitation is one that counters the white possessive of settler colonialism of what, or what Cheryl Harris has called whiteness as property while pointing at once to the oppressive weight of inscription on queer decolonized bodies. It is in this context that Kapadia offers being lost as a queer sensation. Theorizing through the words of Jose Esteban Munoz, Kapadia reminds us that queerness is filled with intention to be lost. Queerness is illegible, it is lost in space and in relation to settler colonial heteronormativity. While I eventually found Kapadia's book, it is a theorization of loss that stays with me. And I want to leave you here as Kapadia does in his book with this utopic vision of a non-space of potentiality. Thank you. Wow, thanks so much. That was really wonderful, Sarah. Um, so let me go ahead and get started and um, greetings uh, uh, and thanks so much to the organizers for putting on this really great salon and especially to Rana for the invitation to be in conversation with you all about this really brilliant, beautiful, searing and, and sustaining book. And I, I wanna begin with a quote from Insurgent Aesthetics. Uh, and it's actually the opening sentence of the book's acknowledgments, literally the first thing you read when you begin at the beginning, quote, this book is first and foremost about the limitless search for more life affirming and imaginative alternatives to the here and now, end quote. So in my brief remarks today, I wanna to surface how I understand the elaboration of this aboutness of insurgent aesthetics, how the book stages the work it does to produce a searching archive, incisive and wide ranging, of a fugitive imagination that points towards something more 
something predicated on affirmation. I'll suggest that among other things, insurgent aesthetics is at once a guidebook and a handbook. This subtle but hopefully useful distinction is meant to name how insurgent aesthetics both guides us in reading a luminous map of diasporic art in the age of imperial decline and offers us finely honed tools ready at hand to craft maps of our own. So I've had the really great pleasure of thinking and talking with Ronek for about a decade, if my email archive is any indicator. Ronek and Manuja Muradian invited me to participate in a session at the inaugural Critical Ethnic Studies Conference at UC Riverside in 2011, a major event whose reality was instantiated by, among many people, Jody Kim, who's here with us today, and Dylan Rodriguez, who's envisioned the freedom courses of which our conversation is a part. Our panel back in the day was entitled Present Future Relations, Alternative Poetics of Race, War, and Internationalism in the Middle East and South Asia. On the panel were Manije, Ronek, Sylvia Chan Malik, and myself. Sylvia presented material that became part of her extraordinary book, Being Muslim, a cultural history of women of color in American Islam. Manije presented a slice of work that would inform her book entitled Neither Washington Nor Tehran, Iranian Internationalism in the United States, forthcoming from Duke. And I did a bit for my own then book in progress. Ronak electrified the room with an early draft of his work on the Iraqi diasporic artist Wafa, Wafa Bilal, centering what Ronak called even then a queer calculus. It was a really good panel. At the time, so many of us in the nascent field of critical ethnic studies, myself included, were attempting to diagnose the operations of the US homeland security state and its expansive and seemingly endless war making. Many of us were trying to find our way through the murky mutations of Bush II's crude civilizationist rhetoric, his administration's plain spoken embrace of torture, even as Obama's technocratic narratives of precision and procedure and the trumpeting of multicultural inclusion recalibrated the schemas through which sovereign violence sought its legitimacy. The labile racial formation that produced and rationalized the devaluing of Muslim, Arab, Afghan, South Asian, and Palestinian life was both long-standing and novel, a late Cold War formation, surely, yet with long and varied genealogies and complex and sometimes unconsidered relationships to the long arc of American empire. The saturation of the visual field, the technologies to target and surveil, the spectacle of photographs of torture, the state-sanctioned play of secrecy and redaction, alongside the illuminating effects of FOIA and WikiLeaks, all this seized and in so many ways delimited the critical imagination. And as for aesthetics, I for one found myself scrambling to think matters of form and style in ways adequate to the pressing matters of the moment. So Ronick's project arrived right on time for me, for so many of us, looking to disorganize and recast the violence, terror, dread in our midst to surface other ways of sensing from up above down to the skin and flesh and into the internal, the innards of empire is Ronick's visceral term. And then out again to the speculative visionary aesthetics that deftly surface Palestinian dreams, quote, outside the dystopian here and now. These are the scales on which the book journeys. Along the way, the book's attention refuses to be held wrapped by the visual offering instead the sonic, the haptic, the tactile, as enriching alternative ways of knowing. 
A life-affirming practice is itself a relational practice. And this is one that insurgent aesthetics performs with exemplary care. So I wanna suggest that the book affirms in at least three ways. First, it says yes to the radical practices of a constellation of artists and cultural producers whose creative praxis allows us to sense the here and now in alternative ways, offering us a rich archive of traces that disorganize and denaturalize the deadening logics of the forever war, even as they refuse the felicitous allure of recognition and representation on liberalism's fraught grounds. In this way, the book's affirmation is also a refusal, a turning away, as Ronak puts it at one point, from the cold, mystifying, and abstract sense-making discourses produced by the homeland security state in the operationalization of forever war. Rona gives an account of these deadening sense-making discourses, don't get me wrong. And it's an account rigorously grounded in the archive of US policymakers and the apparatus of imperial governance that they instantiate. It's just that Ronak refuses to let them have the last word. The gorgeous color plates and figures that populate the book say yes to the luminosity of insurgent aesthetics. And what Ronak calls his quote, critical formalist reading practice affirms the work's possibilities and openings with the care and patience that sits beyond mere rigor. Secondly, insurgent aesthetic says yes to the scholarship, to so much scholarship, to the labor of intellection. The book's cita citational density is extraordinary and the endnotes are themselves an excursus in their own right. Ronick states early on that he's in conversation with scholarly work in, by my count, 27 distinct fields. And I'd plan to enumerate them all in my remarks today, but in the interest of time, I hope you'll trust me when I say that it's both an audacious list and an honest account of the promiscuous multidisciplinary scholarly archive the book convenes. Importantly, this convening is neither haphazard nor gratuitous. Rather, insurgent aesthetics powerfully and deliberately suggests that to study the sensorial life of empire so as to surface its minoritarian insurgent alternatives is to refuse the disciplinary procedures that curtail, delimit, or bound the work, that attempt to lodge it in some singular ordering of knowledge. That's no way to affirm the labors of imagining otherwise. Finally, and here's where I'll conclude, insurgent aesthetics affirms us as readers. While Ronick gives the voices and concepts that arise in his analysis, the space to breathe and to animate the elaboration of his argument, we are never left wondering where Ronick's place is in all this. He always lets us know. He's a generous and patient guide. The claims, the evidence, the interlocutors, the stakes are never out of reach. The concepts Ronick fashions, among them forever war, the sensorial and somatic life of empire, queer calculus, and indeed insurgent aesthetics are given density, weight, heft, and not simply to convince us of their truth value, but to make them available for us as readers to think with in our own here and now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Keith and Sara and Jody and Rona. Thank you, thank you so much for beautiful, beautiful presentation. I want to invite you all to turn your cameras on um, so we can applaud Rona. And um, to our attendees, feel free to light up the chat with comments, questions, thoughts. 
And because we are um, running a little ahead of schedule, um, Rona, you know, I think we've heard how the the images themselves really are. You you stage them in the book, um, and and we have these beautiful col uh, colored images to to think with and enjoy. And I was wondering if you might show us a few, um, so that we can uh, we can celebrate the artists that that um, make up the the insurgent figures of your book. Is that all right? You know, first let me just say, wow. Um, I'm just so floored and so overwhelmed with emotion. Um, I, I feel, you know, quite, quite at a loss. I think I've just like, I feel like a tidal wave of warm feeling over my, <laughs> my entire body, mind. And I'm so grateful to the three of you, four of you, all four of you, for your words, for your love, for your care, for, uh, you know, mixing a sense of memory and our personal connections over a decade and more. Um, with an attention to such stylistic rigor in all of your writing, um, you know, tracing all of these kinds of intimacies, it, it's really outstanding. And I, I, I'm just having kind of an out of body experience, I would say a little bit. So I, I need a moment. Um, and yeah, I have all these images and I can um, scroll through some of them. Um, here first, let me just, you know, come here to this, this piece, which is to say, these are the artists I'm writing about living artists. This is the kind of collection of people who um, make up those gorgeous color plates and more than 90 plus images that Ken and Duke was very kind and generous in letting me publish and reproduce all of the work of these incredible thinkers. And you know, one of the things I, I say in the book and often in these kinds of talks is that these artists are critics and scholars in their own right. They are archivists, they are knowledge workers, they are people who are theorists of the security state in ways that have been extraordinarily important for me as I was building this work. And, you know, Keith, you mentioned in your, in, in your remarks the, the, you know, the, the note about um, all of the fields that are being brought together. And maybe I'll just scroll through as I'm, I'm talking. Is that okay? Does that seem like a good thing to do so that people can see that sounds, some? That's good, yeah. Um, you know, I'm just, I scribbled notes, of course, and so I just want to reflect a little bit about each of what you're saying. And you, you know, Keith, you said luminosity, of course, and it makes me think about light and, you know, Ronak means illumination, luminescence. And so in today's Diwali, the, you know, festival of light. So it's well-timed um, to be thinking about light, especially in this horrific year. And I've also been just reflecting and hearing you all talk about um, the weirdness of what it feels like to be celebrated. Um, and what it means to celebrate in a year that doesn't feel very celebratory. And, um, you know, so I, I'm thinking a lot about that as well. Um, Sadr, I really appreciated your, the vignette you told about, you know, finding the book in the boxes and, and moving and, you know, your own displacement from LA to Berkeley and, you know, how to find the things that are keepsakes and our archives and all of our box, dusty boxes and that, um, you said something that really spoke to me about um, political opacity, which is absolutely the thing that I'm trying to trace throughout the project in all of these complicated ways, the kind of formalist dimension that artists are using to, um, you know, use their own bodies here is the work of Iraqi American artist Wafa Bilal, um, who Keith talked about to some degree in this performance art piece and this gorgeous arresting image of a, ta of a borderless map of Iraq under black light um, that was the product of a 24 hour endurance performance piece in New York City about a decade ago. Um, here's the work of Elin, Ellen O'Hara Slavic and her gorgeous watercolor paintings that look from, you know, aerial views of above of all the places that the U.S. has bombed since 1945 and really gorgeous and sumptuous colors that she uses to describe um, and to illuminate the process of war making and bombing and the kind of arresting and bleeding effect of the watercolors as an example of the um, impact and collateral damages of war making. That's what this work is about. Um, then the Visible Collective, which is, you know, now retired collective of, of, of artists and lawyers and activists, Naim Wainan and uh, Ibrahim Qureshi and others based in New York City, Vivek Bald and lawyers and activists and human rights um, folks who are trying to think of the early days of, two, you know, after 9-11 two, after and trying to think about all of the kind of detention and deportation was happening in New York City, the police repression of Muslim and surveillance of Muslim populations throughout New York City. So this was like the earliest 
angle in for me in this in this project and this is what I first started with and here's the work of the index of the disappeared Maram Ghani and Chitra Ganesh who both have incredible solo careers but have been working steadily over the last 15 years on this collaborative project that they call the index of the disappeared which shows up in all these site specific installations and libraries and galleries and um, you know outside of universities and museums and here's the work of Raj Kamal Cullen, a Berlin-based Indian-American artist who's doing that work that I call the Empire's Innards about thinking about FOIA documents and um, texturizing them in relationship to these gorgeous arresting paintings that are anatomical drawings from the 19th century that she's waterboarded in ink and color and that create these swirling patterns. It's another way of thinking about, um, you know, one of the things that's missing in the book, of course, or but is an urtext um, is the idea that of the kind of visual spectacles of torture after 9-11. So there's no images of Abu Ghraib or the torture images that came out of Iraq, right? Instead, um, it's all of these attempts to go somewhere else, go askance, go to archives and visual archives and records that you don't think of as being the sort of proper objects of study or, um, or discourse in relationship to the torture archives. And so, you know, this brings me and so I'm now I'm just rambling. Kareem, is this okay? Or you're keeping time, track attention. Yeah, to me. absolutely. Let me, let me just close, you know, before we open up, because I'm not looking at the chat since I have my window open. This idea of political, political opacity of insurgent camouflage, I really appreciate this, this refusal to be seen because it's, it is a survival strategy, right? It's the survival strategy of dispossessed and minoritized peoples, but it's also the survival strategy of minoritarian cultural workers in our institutions, namely academic institutions. You know, I've been thinking a lot since this book has been out in the world of how um, how I've become legible or illegible within certain field formations. And so I love that you put me in the queer theory book uh, box because I've been thinking like, oh, why why am I not? I don't get a lot of invitations from queer studies spaces actually, and in, you know, and I, I wonder how people are reading the book and in what kinds of spaces. And I've been thinking about how that kind of opacity is a strategy that I've used my entire adult life, you know, to be the um, in interstitial spaces, whether that's in spaces of art and activism, whether that's spaces in academia, whether that's as a diasporic racialized person in Chicago, you know, I think about um, that opacity as a strategy that's allowed me to survive in so many different ways. And so it's weird and um, strange to have a book that comes out in the world that has some heft to it and that has the subheadings of critical ethnic studies and queer theory and art and visual culture and to be suddenly coherent after years of feeling like an imposter in all of these ways. Um, so I'm thinking about that. Um, and then Jody, you know, you said so many beautiful things. Jody, of course, was my postdoc mentor at UC Riverside and has been supporting my work since I was a graduate student. And her own work on Ends of Empire was so foundational for me to give me some of that historical heft and think about periodization and think about the twinning between expert knowledge and then what you're calling counterinsurgent aesthetics as a way of describing um, military science and military knowledge writ large. And, I think what's strange about our moment now in the um, Obama to Trump era, you know, this project was conceptualized in the Bush years. It was written and researched in the Obama years. It was finalized and jettisoned out in the Trump era. And a lot of people talk about Trump as being um, somehow like an isolationist who's not interested in war, which is just a lie. In fact, he's he's intensified and amplified every front of forever war making around the world, including arms deals that are happening right now between the United States and the UAE and you know the entire Gulf states. And I think because it's not you don't get a lot of popular New York Magazine stories about drones anymore. And that was affixed to Obama. We lose sight of the way in which there's so much forever war making happening all around us, even though the forever wars have come home to roost so much so. And we're seeing the kind of internal dividing orders in the United States context, which I know so many people, and so many of you write about beautifully. Um, and then of course, whatever comes after this moment in 2020, I think um, we can be clear that forever wars are here to stay and that they permutate and shift constantly. And part of why I attend to artists and activists is to not feel eviscerated by those counterinsurgent aesthetics, to not be, to, and as Keith, as you said, to not think of it as a totalizing system of power and to recognize that there are these cracks and fissures. And part of our work as cultural producers 
as intellectuals, as academics, as artists, as archivists, is to find those gaps and erasures and cracks in order to break free into a different moment, to a moment when war does really miss its mark um, because it hasn't yet. Um, uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna- Yeah, you, you should take a breath. Yeah. And um, thank you, that was, that was amazing. I think that's just a reminder of how, of the life of this book itself. And, and that it's extension beyond this, the moment in which it was written or researched and it's reached back into history and its usefulness to, to us as, as ongoing thinkers, thinkers and theorists. Um, I, uh, I wanna encourage folks to ask questions. We have time for questions. Um, we'll go till about 15 after the hour if, if we have questions. Um, comments are also really helpful. Um, look at that, we have, we have one already um, from Judith. Rona, could you speak to the specificities of the artist network constellation your subjects partially map out? It's aesthetic and also social, and it, it is aesthetic and also social and geographic. Can you say something about those dynamics? Such a good question because it is what the group of artists that I've assembled here is, is, a, is a radical sliver of a much larger constellation of people who are doing this kind of work in lots of different ways. And I've looked primarily at the kind of collaborative dimensions of each of these artists' practice. So, for example, the work of Chitra Ganesh, who you know many people have started to write about, um, including my mentor Gayatri Gopinath and others. Uh, you know, I don't talk so much about her solo projects and her solo exhibitions. I'm more interested in the kind of collaborative dimension of the index of the disappeared. And well, why is that? Because I wanted to trace a group of artists, primarily who knew each other who were in conversation, who were building connected tissue as organizers and activists and cultural producers, primarily in New York City, which is where I was based as a graduate student, which is where this first project was uh, imagined. And then as I sort of started to grow, I, I thought uh, I started building out and thinking, oh, there's work happening in Europe in London and Amsterdam and other spaces where people are thinking about along similar pivots. And even though I'm trained in American studies, I can think more broadly here to the transnational domain. And, um, you know, I think something that Ken said to me in my revisions at some point was like, how do you talk about, um, and something that one of my reader reports said is, how do you talk about the fact that you're looking at diasporic artists who are writing about their homelands, right? Or writing or producing art about their homelands. And that, part of their insurgent aesthetic is their vexed and complicated relationship to those spaces, to those home life spaces. Some of whom who have, you know, intense, wonderful, um, hyper mobile transnational circulations and, and, and connections to their homelands. Other people who don't have that kind of privileged mobility at all. And that that, that, that relationship is part of the, um, the, it's negotiated through their art making. And so, you know, there's, there's an explosion of South Asian and Middle Eastern artists who are doing this kind of work at this point. And there are so many other people that I could have included, but I wanted to map the beginnings of a fold, you know, a, a kind of a fold in that broader constellation. And as the book is now kind of circulated and I'm starting to hear more from artists and um, interdisciplinary people who are doing this kind of work, I'm realizing, oh, this does speak not just to that moment in which I was writing and researching, there's a lot of different kinds of constellations. And, um, and, and you know, what's interesting to me and, and to back to this question is like, why is it that certain artists circulate more in the, in the US and Europe than in the Middle East and South Asia? Like, for example, why is Larissa Sansour, who's based in Europe, never had a solo show in the United States? Like, what's that? A, well, there's a lot of stuff there. There's a politics of there, right? Um, why is it that Chitra's work circulates in South Asia and Mariam Ghani's work circulates more in Europe or through the you know, MENA region? And just, this is not my project, but it's something that's a shadow project, is to trace global art markets and the circulation of these artists through these worlds. Because it's a recognition that I'm looking at a very small sliver of, of primarily elite artists who have um, trafficked in these transnational spaces. So I didn't really answer the question, but that's how I'm starting to map out um, the role that contemporary artists of this generation. Why is it also that they're not really on, except for Korean syllabus, they're not really in performance studies, art history classes, visual studies classes. These are people who are, who for more than 10 plus years have been winning every grant you can imagine and, um, you know, circulating and having solo shows and exhibitions. And yet they don't really show up in academic academia in terms of um, the people we think of when we think of, you know, who our contemporary artists are that we write and teach. Um, um, 
I want to point to this comment from Rupa that says Ronak is a scholar and artist. And, and something that Ronak says in the book is that he's part of these networks, you know, um, and is and is an activist and artist inside of these spaces. So I just, I'm, I'm sure you're being modest, but, but I want folks to know that you're a part of that world too. Um, yeah, uh, do we have any other questions, comments, or, or perhaps Jody, Sarah, or Keith have um, thoughts that have been raised um, between hearing each other as well? And also no pressure because it's a Saturday afternoon. How, um, we have a question from Rupa. How do artists more easily access academic work? And it's a question I think we hear a lot about the language we use. What's your studied thoughtful answer to that question? Mine? Yeah. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I was not, I didn't know I would be on the spot. Um, I mean, I think, I think academics have to have two versions of any essay or idea that they're trying to offer, right? One is the one that works within the, the languages that we're writing in inside of the academy, and the other that we can give at a, at a gallery um, to, to other audiences. That's, you know, I, I think we always have to code switch, and we, but we have to train and learn how to code switch. Um, no Sada, what's your thought about that? You know, somebody who does curatorial work and was trained, actually trained in art history. I think part of what I also recognize is the kind of imposter syndrome that I still feel in hearing you talk about my work in the third person, all that the strange out of bodiness is like, oh, am I even legible to art history as someone who wasn't, you know, writing about visual material but not trained in that discipline, um, which, you know, creates all these promiscuities, but then all these problems and struggles as well, both in the writing and crafting and also how I think about it. What's your thought about this question? I mean, um, Ronak, I, I really do identify with what you say about, you know, this question of why don't these artists circulate more readily in art history courses, you know, in art history surveys, um, all of that. That's a, that's a real question. But also to, to this question of how to kind of code switch or go between these worlds. I think one of the ways that I've tackled that is to think of writing and theory and theorizing as a creative practice. So, you know, when I read your book, um, I do think of you as an artist. I just think of myself as an artist because we are uh, engaging in, in a creative practice ourselves. And so I don't create those kinds of divisions between myself and the artists that I write about. I've been, uh, you know, working really hard to think about how to, like you said yourself, how to engage another theoretical thinker, how to engage another uh, person who's theorizing the world, you know, the war, the kinds of um, questions around uh, coloniality, uh, diaspora, all of these questions that we try to think about as theorists, somebody else is doing in a different medium, uh, but still within this world, still within, within the kind of context of um, the political, the, the political now present. And so, you know, I think the less that division is ossified, the better for, for everyone. And the, you know, the more you can have those kinds of conversations. That's really helpful. And, you know, there is some arbitrariness to the divisions and discreteness between art, activism, academia. The same is true about organizing and activism, uh, which speaks to Anarima's question. Hi, Rima, in the chat um, about new lines of flight for my for my work. Um, it also reminds me of my mentor, late mentor, Jose Esteban Munoz, who, you know, he was such a great model of someone who, like, just did a lot of deep hanging out with artists. His friends were the people that he wrote about. And, you know, that kind of deep, affective, you know, politics of friendship and, you know, uh, is, was an early model for me of like, oh, um, these things don't have to create these unnecessary hierarchies in your mind and that, you know, it's in that deep hanging out that the, the theory emerges. And um, I certainly feel that way. And I've been thinking about how to do that in the context of Zoom and virtuality in this moment when we can't have the studio visits in person and, um, you know, how that's certainly transformed and dislocated so many dimensions of our lives. Rima, to your question in the chat about, um, you know, how this conversation connects to current research. So my new project is about, it's called Breathing in the Brown Queer Commons. And I was trying to think about breath and respiration and breathing before COVID, 
um, as a metaphor for flight and for freedom. So it really does take up from the Sansor end of the book discussion. And, you know, it's inspired by works like Christina Sharp and Ashan Crowley and people who've been writing so beautifully about breathing aesthetics and breathing matter and breathing is um, crucial, uh, you know, constraining breathing is crucial to torture tactics on the slave plantation all the way to the present, right? Um, I can't breathe and let us breathe campaign and all the organizing of BLM onward. So breath is one tr thing I'm trying to think through. And then the other dimension is healing justice, what we call healing justice, which is, you know, a, a framework of organizing and activism by Southern and rural and queer and trans femme um, activists to say that actually healing needs to be central to liberation work. It's not the thing that happens on the side of movement work, that healing and, you know, dealing with collective forms of trauma, whether that trauma is capitalism or colonialism or slavery or terrorism or political violence writ large, that the part of the work of organizing in the contemporary moment can historically is about, um, you know, being in right relationship to oneself, but one's community. So I'm moving from national security, you know, transnational modes of security, to talking about security of the body, security of communities. You know, how do we, what does collective safety and security mean? That's such a big conversation within in the, the rubric of abolition right now. Um, so that's the move that I'm making. And it's much more about interiority. And it's also the third element of the new project is a recognition of the thought of chronic wellness. So we have such a diagnosis and uh, of chronic illness and all in it. And when I mean chronic illness here, I mean that as a metaphor for the diagnoses of the dominant social worlds and state violence. And that, you know, we have endless arrays of scholarly and activist work about all the ways that the world is structured to produce harm and magnify harm. And how do we talk about chronic wellness for ourselves for our communities, for like living long lives in our institutions. Um, those are the sorts of things. And I, I, you know, of course, this is the year when everyone is, is locked to their ch chairs at home and starved the touch and sociality and, you know, and our senses are so impoverished in all these ways. So those are, you know, so it's like body and senses war, but in relationship to community, that's kind of how I'm thinking about this. That was a nice answer, I really not that. Thanks for that, Rana. You know, um, Keith spoke to the the skill with which you take up aesthetics and 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 make it important. And we have a question that asks: Could you speak about how the book handles the decolonizations of aesthetics, specifically aesthetics as a colonial philosophical construct? That's such a huge question, and it's certainly one that others are taking on more prodigiously and more thoughtfully. I think about the work of people like David Lloyd or Candace Chu or Nicole Fleetwood's new book, Marking Time, which is so brilliant, that is um, giving us all of this theorizing about both, first of all, the human, right, and the limits of the human, but then also thinking about who gets to be the subject of man, you know, who gets to be the subject of aesthetics, uh, always, of course, Western and Eurocentric in focus. And so what is the role of minoritarian aesthetics, if we can say, um, to say, no, that these are, these are not just, like, we're not just doing a sociological reading of these artists of color or, or diasporic artists as offering a kind of, you know, uh, antidote or theory about war making. No, they are also, um, they are also innovating at the level of their craft and formalist dimensions, the kinds of aesthetic strategies that they um, take on um, are innovating in ways that not only challenge all of these political ideas that we might be bringing together, but they're also um, transforming what we call aesthetics writ large. And there's so much work, and Kareem's work, of course, is foundation here. Sada's forthcoming book is, you know, it's very much in this vein. I, I know Leticia Alvarado, my cohort member, is in the chat. Um, there's so many people writing in this way to challenge um, capital A aesthetics, capital H human. Um, and so I feel very buoyed by that relational orbit of people who are engaged in that way. And I know, you know, Keith's new book is about, uh, you know, the saturation of the visual frame in, rel in relationship to war making. Um, Jody's work on debt, we didn't talk about it in the bio, but I think there's much, there's so much connectivity there, your new book as well. So um, I just love being in conversation with all of you. Thanks for that, Rana. Thanks for sort of the generosity of inviting everybody into your work as well. Um, in our last few minutes, I just wanted to ask our, our attendees if there are any final comments or thoughts you want to share in the chat, and also our panelists, um, Jody, Sarah, Keith, if there are any final thoughts you want to put out, um, praises, applauses. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I maybe maybe I'll start while I have the floor, but um, I met Ronak in 2004 or so in New York. And when Ronak was telling me about, <clears throat> Ronak was just about to start graduate school and was telling me that he was going to start, um, he was going to study South Asian and Middle Eastern artists. And I was like, you can do that? <laughs> I, I really did not have an example um, of anyone who was thinking about, given, given where I'd gone to college, uh, thinking about South Asian and queer, South Asian queerness together. Um, and so really, I'm, I think I've told you this before, but you, you're very much a model for me of what, um, <clears throat> what scholarship could be and could do, um, that it is life-giving as well. Um, alongside art, scholarship too is life-giving um, and self-affirming. Um, and so thank you, thank you for setting, setting that up. Um, and, and, and I feel lucky to be here with you today. Um, I could think of no better moderator for this discussion, not only given our many years friendship and you know, following us each other from Chicago to New York and beyond, but also your beautiful book, Ishtal, which came out this year. Let's, not, let's drop that in the chat. Um, all the future books that you have already lined up in queue for us. Your drag work is Lahore, Rajasthan. I mean, you talk about models and mentors of people. And I think peer mentors is such a great way of thinking about the work that we've done when we were kids. And now as we're all kind of grownups, um, it's wild to see. And I, I so appreciate you and appreciate the, the model that you set us for, you know, what does it mean to have an interdisciplinary practice and a creative practice? And you certainly are that for me. So thank you so much. Any final words before we go? I'm not following the chat at all, but I see there's still some folks in here. I know these things will actually be posted on the internets um, in perpetuity. So I'm grateful for everybody who zoomed in today and um, spent some time with us on a Saturday afternoon. And um, thank you, Jody, Keith, Sara, Karim, Ken, whose picture we see, uh, Dylan, who I know is in the chat. Um, I'm so grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jess, if I can request, can you drop the link to the book um, and the, the uh, discount code? Please buy this book. It is worth owning. It is worth holding and loving. The, the, and, and having the physical copy, had, it has texture, it has shine. There are beautiful images inside of it. Celebrate it. Um, let it illuminate your life. Um, congratulations, Ronak, on a gorgeous book. It's been out for a year, and we already feel its impact in the in in our various fields. Um, and so, thank you, thank you for this gift of a book.